We're now going to have a Q&A. There's a couple of roving mics. Um, if you could say who you are and where you're from, ask your question, and then once you've asked a question, could you return the mic, because the mic has to keep moving. Um, and so could uh, any questions on the topics that have been raised, and uh, uh, maybe an insight, or indeed a question. So um, it's open to the conference. Hi, uh, Jared Keith, Larry Young Company. Um, I'd be interested to understand what the panel think may be the future for the likes of uh, the uh, retail warehouse market on the basis of can you see a time when they're repurposed to the last mile um, and the th third party delivery uh, operators moving out of retail entirely and moving into that section? Thanks, Stuart. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I actually, I mean, the theory is, 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 is sound. It's a rational thought process. Um, I think, though, we need to see massive rental deflation before that becomes a reality. Um, to give you a flavor, um, we, we own a, what's called a Tesco dark store down in, in southeast London in Croydon, uh, where we've just agreed the rent review, the rent's just gone up from £7 to £10 a foot. And Tesco use it, it's fitted out, it's 200,000 square feet, it's, it's fitted out like your traditional Tesco. Um, the difference is, it's that it is staffed full of, of pickers who, who, who look to fulfil your online order um, for that part of London. The rent on it is £10 a foot, as I say. Across the tram tracks, you, there's, a, there's a Sainsbury's where the rent is probably somewhere between £30 and £35. Not quite comparing apples with, 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 with apples, but, but you get the appreciation that we seem to see, we need to see massive rental deflation in one and continuing appreciation in, in, in the other. Um, that, that's for a complete repurpose. I do think though, that there are opportunities in food stores where surplus space will be used as, as, as that last mile um, uh, facility. Um, but, but again, the rents are gonna fall. I mean, you know, rents on Tesco food stores at 25 pound a foot on 100,000 square feet you know, is, is, is a different age. You know, that, that was 10 years ago. Um, but but um, I think that, that the theory is, is sound. I think the economics don't, 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 don't work for me. There's a question also about, was it just um, the superstores or was it uh, retail warehousing generally? Looking at it just objectively in a, in, in a broader sense, um, land is always valuable. There is always a question of repurposing land, and uh, we see it. It's interesting, isn't it, that um, looking at uh, a, a large portfolio of mainly London-based properties that's for sale at the moment, um, one of the most valuable uses is last-mile logistics where I think in London now last mile logistics is actually getting up in the, in the 20 pounds a foot level um, to the extent that uh, there are some old office buildings that are actually seeing last mile logistics going into them because ceiling height is not so important for that particular thing. So I think repurposing is something that continues to happen in real estate and I guess that uh, I think also the thing I heard today was that there are various different uses. So furniture is a very difficult thing to do online. Um, so basically home decoration is a pretty difficult thing to do online, so timber and so on. So they're not necessarily the highest um, value, nor actually the highest rent payers, but that seems to be something that will continue in that marketplace. I suspect the idea of actually mixing uh, some of the big boxes actually where you are doing last minute mild distribution, click and collect and sales all together would be that sort of repurposing. But of course then you've got to look at this from a planning point of view because the two aren't necessarily compatible planning wise as well. The other thing I would say about big pieces of land is densification. 
So if you, you know, basically what do you do up in the airspace above this? And I think that's something that you'll see more and more of that happening in time, that you start seeing people using the, the, the airspace above to densify uses as well when we are stuck for land uh, urban centres. If, if I may just, just add, I think one of the things I didn't talk much about is um, in this world that is getting more complicated, you need to be more and more granular in your analysis and understanding. So if you look at categories, you can quickly see something's doing well or badly, but when you prize apart, there'll be winners and losers. So if you look at, say, clothing, you'll have uh, a subsector like athleisure doing very, very well. When you then break it down to individual retailers, you'll have huge range of performance, and then you go further into individual stores, you'll have big ranges. If you take that to the real estate sort of analogy, um, all retail parks or retail warehouses aren't equal, and the difference between sort of your traditional big box, box trade parks is very, very different to if you look at something like um, the Glasgow Forts or the, the Fort Canards that we have in our portfolio. And actually, the strongest performance in our portfolio has been on those probably those sort of five or so larger um, uh, retail, what would have been called retail parts or shopping parks, uh, where we continue to invest and involve. But you're right, the demand is increasingly from different sorts of users, different sorts of retailers going into those spaces. Uh, so if you look 10 years ago and thought about people like Hotel Chocolat or Swarovski going into those spaces, they're not the first names that you would have sort of thought about for those kind of occupiers. Um, and so this importance of understanding the space, the supply-demand dynamics, and continue to evolve is going to be ever more important. Um, well, it is. <coughs> I think I think infrastructure is really interesting because it's something that, um, if you look at it in trends, most investors now actually see real assets as being what they're investing in, and real estate is just part of the real asset sector. Um, a number of the large institutions, the CEO of the real estate investment management side is actually CEO of real assets, Bill Hughes is actually head of real estate and infrastructure. And the two are inextricably linked. I mean, because infrastructure, take Crossrail. Crossrail is actually basically a piece of infrastructure which is changing value horizons across London. Um, and it, basically it is, uh, it is real estate because Crossrail is actually taking real estate, whether it's under the ground, above the ground, or the impact it has over. The other thing that infrastructure does is provide long-term potentially CPI linked income uh, and so if you look at it I think it fits into this alternative category um, <clears throat> there's a lot of funds Macquarie being one that specialize in infrastructure um, we are working with a two Chinese clients that actually they are very very focused on infrastructure in fact they've been selling all of their primary uh, portfolios globally in real estate and actually buying into index linked and mainly infrastructure type investments. So uh, infrastructure, I think, as a skill set in our industry, we need to sort of shape up for it because everybody wants it. From our side, um, it's less about the direct investment in the infrastructure, but more around being uh, really focused on the impact on that on our sites. So if you look at London, um, the Crossrail example has been really key to our investment strategy over the last five years or so. So we bought the Paddington Central sort of uh, office campus. Um, a lot of that was driven by, partly it was local regeneration, but the Crossrail story which we bought into, we already had Paddington at the other end. Uh, so we already had Broadgate near Liverpool Street. Uh, and then more recently, we've uh, added to our investments in Ealing and very recently in Woolwich as well uh, because we kind of buy into that um, infrastructure story and the regeneration opportunities that that will bring about. 
I have nothing to add. <laughs> it's full of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, energy as a, an asset class. Um, the <clears throat> probably the interesting thing is that if you look at it, I go back to natural capital, and I'm sure you're going to hear a lot about it in, in the next sessions. Um, <clears throat> natural capital is a really big growth sector. So uh, basically sustainable energy and sustainable activities are things that people are investing in. The difficulty is access to them. It's interesting that the largest um, forestry uh, investment vehicle has just been bought, um, forestry investment management. The interesting thing about forestry investment management is wonderful sustainable activity generates decent returns. But actually, the thing that's in that activity is also wind power and solar. Um, and I think you're seeing that this is where I, I think the expansion of the real estate sector is getting into these naturally sustainable areas. So wind power, solar, hydrology, uh, basically biomass, all of these are actually land-based activities. And they are areas that you'll see large institutions, particularly sovereign institutions, moving into. So Norges, it's not a secret, they came to see us to talk about how they could build up a large um, farming and forestry portfolio. The trouble is the volumes aren't very big. So when Norges say, I want large, I mean a billion. Well, that's going to take 10 or 15 years to amass. So that was, we're a bit disappointed with that story. But I think it's growing. Um, and it becomes part of the real estate spectrum. It's the real asset spectrum. It's this movement into alternatives. Hi, uh, Mark Harris from EDI. Um, with interest rates rising in America and Europe and the UK lagging but bound to follow, I'm very concerned about the impact on property values, uh, just like bonds, closely related, they will fall as the value of them will fall as interest rates rise. Um, and I wondered if the panel could comment on that. I understand the importance of income, the importance of income growth on capital growth, but the yield effect could be quite significant. Can we start on that? I'll go now. Okay, Mark. Um, I think that um, people have tried to, to look at the correlation over many years between bonds and, and, and real estate yields. Um, I think the biggest the biggest way to differentiate bonds and, and property yields is, is that you the bond, um, there is no growth. It is flat, um, and therefore, um, if you can, re your alternative is to reinvest into the, the real estate sector where you are going to get growth, um, preferably guaranteed growth, RPI, CPI, and whatever, then effectively, the, the, the more appropriate compar comparison would be for, with index-linked bonds, which are still trading at around about just over 1%. Uh, I think index-linked treasuries are you know, at, at relatively low levels. And across Europe, I think index-linked treasuries will be negative. Um, so I think that one of the things, the decisions we made a few years ago was to, to, to rather than just ride the real estate sector up and down, you know, in 2009, the tide went out and everything fell, you know, over the next five years, the money flowed back in and, and, and a lot of sectors rose. We believe real estate yields today have entered a period of tranquility, albeit increasingly polarised. And therefore, I think to ensure that you are protected from rising interest rates, because they will rise, I mean, none of us know when, but um, is, is to make sure that you are in sectors that are structurally supported with some form of income growth implicit within them. And so that, 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 that's been our pivot, um, rather than just relying on yield shift. You need income growth, and then you can, you can, you can dismember that comparison with a, with, with a, from, from a bond. Yeah, the, um, I think there's different issues affecting interest rate movements. Um, one is, of course, quantitative easing actually put pressure on interest rates coming down. And Andrew's exactly right. You know, in, in, in Europe, actually, the re real interest rates, is, I think, which I think is an important thing to look at, real interest rates are largely negative. I think 40, 50 percent of German bunts are actually yielding negative real interest rates. So, you know, we've got to remember the problem we had which caused all of this was to actually deal with a fundamental banking problem we, we, we had in the 
economy. What makes interest rates rise is because central banks say we've got an inflation, we're worried about inflation, we need to make them, we, we need to put them up, or there is um, an issue of controlling economic growth to actually try and avoid inflation. The two are linked. Um, so the expectation was that interest rates would be rising probably more quickly than they have. Um, certainly economic growth in this country is not something you suggest is actually sort of getting carried away with itself and inflation um, is an issue. Oil prices have gone up again, but again, you put interest rates up, the effect on the consumer where wage rates are not going up that, that, that much at the moment has a real impact. So there's a real balance in this. If you look at the forward markets, the forward markets are not suggesting there's a huge hike in interest rates due. Um, effect on real estate prices, yes. Um, the first thing you have to look at, and of course you might hear about this later, is the, 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 the level of gearing in the market. Because if interest rates are go, affects uh, re, re, uh, re-leveraging pricing, then you would expect um, that to have an impact. But gearing generally is actually quite low. And most people are um, keeping uh, it low because actually that's what the, the REITs and the investors want. Um, In the US, it's different. You've got a rising economy. You have got rising inflation. But even then, the expected level of almost quarterly interest rate rises haven't happened quite to the level that you would have expected. Um, Another factor affecting us, of course, is the exchange rate, which is all Brexit-driven. And that's imported inflation into the market as well. Um, (coughs) Logically, If interest rates rise because we've got inflation and economic growth, you'd expect to see some response in rental growth as well. And that's actually always been the the, the balance. Um, But I think that the question you've got to ask yourself is, do we think, with quantitative easing being removed, which effectively they have stopped doing it now, from the marketplace, um, and asset prices looking fairly full, do we expect an adjustment because of you know, movement in real values? And in some sectors, I think you can see that happening already. Hi there, uh, Donald Anderson, Playfair Scotland. Uh, and Andy uh, surreptitiously skipped over any kind of discussion of constitutional political issues in his presentation, uh, which I thought was quite interesting. I, I do wonder, I mean, the description of a, an economy that is lagging behind in, in European terms, uh, we've been through a debate in Scotland about constitutional issues that did cause a lot of investment investors to hold back. I just wonder what the mood music is like at the moment and what the fears are about the possible implications of a Brexit decision uh, being implemented in a, 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 posit- a relatively positive way, not a positive way, or a, a, really, uh, a really bad outcome for us. Have you got a feel for what the, f- the fears are in an economy, as you've described, which is so heavily dependent on foreign direct investment? Um, I wasn't avoiding it so much as actually sort of basically in the time I was given, actually how long have you got to discuss all these things. Uh, Let me try and deal with it in several ways. Um, I was in Madrid when the Scottish vote happened, and it was interesting there because actually, frankly, the thing that they were, they, they were watching this as closely as you were here, and the reason being is that they had Catalonia looming. Um, and you can see what's happening now as a result of that. And I think the f- it's shown in the figures. I mean, if you look at, if you like, the recovery of the markets and actually the Scottish volumes versus generally UK markets, you haven't recovered to the level that you might have done because there is perhaps a confidence issue there. Um, as far as Brexit is concerned, um, the interesting thing is that I spent, when taking on my new role, I spent a lot of time going to see the offices that we have and the relationships we have in the Far East and um, uh, Middle East. And Brexit is an issue. It's actually just to do with actually relative pricing for them. It's not stopping them from looking at investing in the UK. It's just a question of where they see relative values. A lot of them saw values being pushed too high, yields going too low, and so therefore Europe look more interesting. If you go to Germany now, Germany, it looks very expensive. Um, the things that they were concerned about was that you know, the UK economy is still a strong economy. It's not a, it's not a 
weaker is 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 a big big economy so it's an open economy language law and everything else transparency is important the thing they were concerned about though was a gradual shift of moving away from being as open and transparent as we have been so in other words um you know, stamp duty affecting money coming into the market particularly residential has some impact, but it was to do with the treatment of overseas um, investors. Firstly, for CGT, and now actually the treatment in terms of uh, interest rate relief on debt, whereas a lot of them use debt to hedge currency. Um, so 2019, there is issue, this issue about actually limiting the amount of um, uh, interest leveraging you can get relief against and they've basically said those dynamics are changing in terms of the investment as well um, I definitely think as far as Europe is concerned a lot of European investors are rethinking the UK simply because uh, particularly German open-ended funds they have to hedge it's adding 150 basis points to their yield requirements so that becomes an issue um, I think that the other thing is that you know you've seen this rise in populism across Europe and I think that's also it's not just Brexit it's actually which way is the economy going to go you know, if we move more to the left that has issues as well in terms of the way that some and certainly if you look at it from a private individuals the ones that are actually the new investors in the market they worry about something like that too so I think the politics of the moment is you know basically affecting confidence no doubt about it at all you know institutions are looking for value or global institutions are looking for value elsewhere at the moment that's why the volumes are going down does that answer the question yeah. great well uh, that uh, closes our q a and i'd just like to at this point thank uh, our speakers andy andrew and ben uh, for their excellent contributions today it's certainly a very uh, useful insight into to what's happening and the future. So if you could join me in thanking them.